Buenos días a todos. En primer lugar, eh, quisiera pedirles disculpas ¿eh? por este retraso. ¿eh? Hemos tenido unos, unos minutos de retraso porque, eh, inesperadamente, hemos tenido un, una caída del servicio de Internet, eh, lógicamente ajena a la, a la voluntad de, de la Fundación, y nuestros técnicos pues, han conseguido poder restablecer. Entonces, lo primero es eh, pedirles disculpas por este pequeño retraso. Eh, como les decía, bienvenidos. Bienvenidos al segundo foro participativo online del proyecto Mercado Jalal. Foro que hemos titulado Aproximación al turista musulmán. Este foro titulado Aproximación al turista. José Manuel Cervera, en el mío propio y en el. En nombre en el, ¿no? de todos. En este proyecto, en este Mercado Jalal, les doy la bienvenida. Queremos agradecer y dar las buenas vindas plataforma Zoom. Tanto los que están aquí presentes como los que están a seguir a través de Facebook. En primer lugar, quiero informar a todos los participantes que este evento está a ser grabado. The reason being, we are going to facilitate the streaming, the recording to anybody who has not been able to be present live. We will also place it on the YouTube uh, channel and we encourage you to subscribe. And we will also publish a podcast. Uh, it's mandatory mm, due to COVID. Fundación Tres Culturas, en cualquier evento que hacemos, y en este no va a ser menos, a que por favor sigan, aunque la vacuna está más cerca, sigan todas las recomendaciones de las autoridades sanitarias y en, en, en un a lo de responsabilidad pues tengamos un poco de paciencia en estos difíciles momentos que vivimos que nos hacen que este evento que debería ser presencial pues siga siendo online. Eh, yo voy a presentarles el acto, les voy a presentar a los ponentes e inmediatamente les voy a dar la, la palabra. En primer lugar, eh, querría agradecer muy especialmente a nuestros dos traductores de hoy que eh, tienen una tarea complicada eh, porque vamos a hacer una doble traducción eh, eh, a inglés, por un lado. Saludo también a, a nuestro compañero Juan Carlos Acosta y a portugués. Aprovecho también para saludar a Candice, con lo cual yo le voy a pedir tanto a los participantes como a los intervinientes, por favor, que tengan un poco de paciencia porque tenemos que hacer dos saltos en la interpretación simultánea, pero por la calidad que estoy seguro que vamos a tener en el foro, va a merecer la pena. Entonces, por favor, pido un poco de paciencia. The patience to, I'm asking the, the audience as well as the participants and speakers, and now I'm, I'm selecting the audience. You have to select the channel. You can select the English channel if you want to get it in English, receive it in English, or the Portuguese. As I stated before, the structure of the event is the following. Basically, it's going to be the presentation of the three speakers on my side. In second place, once I have introduced the speakers, I will give the floor to Javier Albaracín. I will introduce him immediately. He will also introduce, even though it might be redundant, he will introduce. Y después uh, vamos a oír la presentación de la aproximación al turista. E eu, e também, eh, através de Nabil Sharif, vamos ouvir a exposição de um caso prático. E por isso queremos agradecer a presença de todos. E enviamos os nossos cumprimentos a Javier Albarra, Albarra Sim, que está também desde Barcelona e que vai participar também. Eh, no final da exposição, todos podem eh, formular as suas perguntas. Este fórum que trata sobre eh, a certificação, o primeiro fórum foi, eh, tratamos a certificação halal. 
e neste segundo fórum eh, queremos focalizar o turista muçulmano, o turista muçulmano millennial e por isso contamos com a presença de Shelly. I've also further to add, this is part of the Halal Market Project. The Halal Market Project, we have four partners, the Three Cultures Foundation as the main, <clears throat> the main, uh... e também os sócios andaluzes e do Alentejo e Algarve. Quero também Cumprimentar Merca Córdoba, eh, Simbal e todos os outros participantes. Eh, vou eh, apresentar agora os nossos participantes. E tenho a certeza de que vão... Eh, ajudar-nos muito com a sua valiosa informação. E, Javier Albarracín vai coordenar este, este foro e, portanto, ele é licenciado em Ciências Políticas pela Universidade de Barcelona. E é a primeira vez que contamos com a vossa presença. E bom dia, Javier. Javier tem mais de 20 anos de experiência neste mercado com eh, os muçulmanos. Trabalhou na Embaixada de Istambul e também trabalhou com o Oriente Médio. E tam também foi diretor do, do Instituto Europeu do Mediterrâneo durante nove anos. Atualmente é o sócio fundador de Barcelona Halal Service e desenvolve projetos eh, focados no eh, projetos muçulmanos. E depois eh, vamos ouvir Celina e Nabil. Se, quis, se quiserem, podem eh, também eh, fazer as perguntas através dos pods ou do chat. Todas essas perguntas serão transladadas aos aos interessados. Quero apresentar a Celina, autora de um best-seller. Celina, bem-vinda e muito obrigada por participar do nosso fórum. É, o livro da Celina é Vai é, falar sobre os, os muçulmanos num futuro próximo, num mercado hum, halal. Ela vai explicar um pouco é, é, sobre do que trata esse livro. Ela também é vice-presidente de marketing islâmico. E também eh, que é o primeiro eh, escritório de marca muçulmana. Ela é uma das 500 pessoas muçulmanas mais influentes do mundo e uma das principais eh, mulheres neste. The United Kingdom. So you can see there who can be better than Selina to explain and to give us her perspective and her view about the topic. 
And for last and not least, as it's uh, as, as the saying goes, I would like to introduce Nabil Sharif. He's a travel industry professional. Where he's based in the UK with more than 15 years of experience, and that's already a lot. And he's a pioneer in the global halal tourism industry. Nabil is... Uh, he has studied in the University of London, marketing, and in 2012, with the intention... ...dedicado a este turismo halal. ...los operadores turísticos de lujo del Reino Unido, que se llama Serendipity Tailor Made y Luxury Halal Travel. Así que tanto Nabil como Shelina, como Javier, eh, son los intervinientes que tienen ustedes en el día de hoy so, para que nos ilustren sobre el tema. Yo mm, volveré a retomar la palabra al final, en, en, el, en el momento de, de, de las preguntas, que, insisto, pueden ustedes hacer desde ya, a través de Facebook o a través del chat de la plataforma, o esperar a, al final y hacerlas eh, cuando terminen sus intervenciones. Nada más por mi parte, eh, simplemente cederle, eh, como se dice ahora, el micrófono virtual, eh, cederle la pantalla a Javier Albarracín para que eh, comencemos el debate. Javier, cuando quieras, por favor. Es un placer para mí, un placer real y personal y profesional estar aquí con ustedes en este foro. Muchísimas gracias, Germinal, por la presentación. Gracias a las tres culturas y muchísimas gracias a Selina y a Nabil. Es un gran honor para mí estar aquí. Nos... Hablar con ustedes y oír, eh, y oír sus opiniones expertas. Selina, había comentado. Eh, o comentar con Celina y hacer algunas preguntas para saber uh, su opinión al respecto. Una experta profesional en un segmento creciente que, que se está convirtiendo, digamos, en algún tipo de... en un, sec, en un sector, segmento económico que, es va, que, que tiene valor, es creativo y a veces pensamos que, que, los, que, los, que los musulmanes, que, lo, que, que los musulmanes como consumidores son un bloque único, pero desafortunadamente nos olvidamos que, so, que, están, que es una población que está creciendo y que es una población que aña, añade un gran valor. Así que, Selina, le voy a hacer la pregunta. ¿Puede elaborar un poco más sobre este segmento que... Que, que usted ya le ha dado incluso un, un nombre a esta generación. ¿Quiénes son? ¿Quién son? ¿Qué expectativas podemos tener? ¿Y qué, y qué expectativas socioeconómicas eh, tiene este seguimiento? Y es eh, obrigado a todos y es eh, un gran placer poder participar aquí. Celina, ¿o qué significa ser un consumidor musulmán? Eh, no somos la uh, mayor gente dedicada a este seguimiento y, y podemos afirmar que, que tem una gran importancia como consumidores. A, a razón a razón de ese crecimiento es que a partir de 2001 eh, mudó ese clima político y también debido al desarrollo de la Internet donde ese es uh, el joven, el joven musulmán, eh, a través de internet, también eh, demanda más. Y por eso 
é tão importante este jovem islâmico. Por isso, queremos eh, dizer o quanto é importante para nós é sermos muçulmanos. E muitas vezes, eh, quando vemos como é praticada a nossa fé e como é vista por outras pessoas que não, que não dão a importância que para nós tem eh, a nossa religião. Por isto, eh, através dos jovens, está a aumentar né? como consumidores e, e por isto... Estes jovens querem fazer parte do mundo moderno sem abandonar a fé. Por isto, em todas as categorias, por exemplo, através da moda, estamos a falar também de todos os outros setores, medicamentos, moda, viagens. E muito Muitas vezes cometemos o erro. E Generation M, the, the term that's been coined, that I've coined for this audience, of course, in the Gulf, the Middle East. But actually, one of the surprising things is that of the 1.8 billion Muslims in the world, 500 million actually live as minorities around the world, and that there are more than 80 countries in the world that have a population of more than 1 million Muslims. So that means that this is very much a global phenomenon and we need to think about those millions and millions of Muslims who live as minorities. And in Europe, there are estimates that there could be up to 5 million, uh, 50 million Muslims in Europe. So this is a, a huge audience uh, that when we've spoken to them about the kind of engagement that they would like from brands and from organizations, Typically, in every study we've asked them about the way they feel served or underserved by brands, around two thirds consistently come back and say they would like more engagement from brands in a way that connects with that Muslim identity of theirs. And the final thing I would say at this stage is that over the summer, we saw a lot of protest, a lot of movement, a lot of discussion around the fact that we are not speaking to all of our communities in a way that is representative and honest and inclusive. While, while the protest may have been focused around, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter, actually there is a bigger conversation going on about audiences like Muslim consumers that are not properly being represented And attached to that, of course, is with the effects of the pandemic economically, this becomes a real growth opportunity as our economies, they might dip, but as they start to pick up, businesses are looking for that opportunity of who to talk to. And this Muslim consumer segment, Generation M, is really should be at the top of the list. inventó ese término de, le dio ese término de generación M. Eh, ¿Podrías definir desde un... ¿Qué valores tienen, pueden, podrían tener estos segmentos? Usted dice que, so, que es un tema global, pero con su experiencia, que hay una diferencia, como hay que decirse a ellos, si están si los musulmanes están en, una, en un país y son minoritarios o si son mayoritarios. Hay que dirigirse de una forma diferente a ellos. Vale, vamos a ver si sabemos lo que significa ser generación M. Yo hablaba en, de, en los cambios en términos del eh, septiembre, 11 de septiembre del 2001. El, la, la audiencia Target pueden tener de 15 a 35 años. Pero, por favor, recuerden que esta combinación de fe y modernidad es una actitud... Extend beyond that into the 40s, 50s, and perhaps even beyond. They are people who really feel very comfortable 
um, being identified as Muslims who see that there is real value in their faith for themselves, but also for the world around them. They want, um, they want authority to be held accountable. They want to learn knowledge about the world. They're very open and engaging. They feel like they're trying to create a new story from traditional cultures, which in their words, they would say is they're bringing being Muslim into a modern era. And what all of that means is that uh, while it's very clear, perhaps very obvious when we're looking at Muslim minorities and Generation M is only one segment within a wider Muslim population. So we need to remember that uh, not everybody who's a Muslim we would define in this Generation M perspective, but they are perhaps clearest when we're looking in minority Muslim countries. Having said that, of course, this tension between culture and tradition and reinventing a modern life is very present in Muslim majority countries too. And when we formulate campaigns and we're thinking about consumer ideas and products and services, there is a conversation to be had with the Generation M consumer segment within even those Muslim majority countries because they feel they have a different story, different insights, different tensions that are pulling at them from the ones that perhaps their parents experienced, or even as a contrast to what we might call more traditionalist uh, Muslim voices within the same communities. And that's often a mistake that brands make is they feel like kind of being Muslim because most people are Muslim in a majority country, they don't need to speak to that identity when actually these young people are experiencing their Muslim faith in quite a different way. So if we look, for example, at Malaysia or Indonesia, and Indonesia is currently the world's largest Muslim population, there is an upcoming generation of young Muslim women, for example, who have been adopting the headscarf as a symbol of their faith in a way that perhaps their parents' generation didn't, but they are also going into universities and the workplace in a way that their mothers may not have done. And they are trying to create a new space for themselves which respects their families and their tradition and heritage, but also carves out something for themselves and breaks all these traditional boundaries that would have they would have come up against. And this, this, this is also part of the characteristic of Generation M, this desire to do good for the community and uphold the, the community ideals. And one of the Islamic concepts in that is called Ummah, the global Muslim nation. So this sense of kind of being part of a bigger community that you have as your family and that you trust and that you love. And I'm sure Nabil can talk about the importance of that feeling of Ummah when you travel. Um, but while they're trying to balance that sense of what it means to be from a community and wish them well, there is this new tension where Generation M Muslims are saying, well, they want to do something for themselves. It's really important that they explore their own identity, that they create their own new space, that they, they have a sense of fulfillment for themselves while balancing it with their families and communities. And in that tension is something quite interesting for a lot of the products and services and the way that the brands talk to them. hablamos en cuál es la, la, en la diferencia de los musulmanes en Malasia, Malasia, Indonesia o Alemania. Hay que tomar también en cuenta los antecedentes y, y el historial de identidades en los diferentes. Por ejemplo, en, en, no es lo mismo un musulmán turco que un musulmán kurdo. Hay que centrarse también en la cultura específica de la comunidad, ¿no? ¿Cierto? Bien, pienso que la respuesta es sí, ¿no? No es la respuesta más fácil. Pero uno de los temas que necesitamos, tenemos que eliminar la idea 
esto no es como cuando estás en la escuela y aprendes religión en un libro de texto. Esto no es como los musulmanes viven su vida, aunque todo el mundo le gustaría pensar quizás que sea así. Y la conversación que tienen que tener las marcas es la experiencia que les gustaría tener con estas personas. Ahora estamos viendo alguna mayor sofisticación en la forma que se dirigen durante, a los musulmanes en Ramadán, la, el tiempo, la temporada de ayuna. Los musulmanes tienen, se les espera de ellos que tengan... But the reality of that is very different. Um, there's a struggle. People fall short. People change their behaviors. You know, people eat more instead of eating less. And I, you know, those are little examples of how what these young Muslims are looking for is a, a connection to the challenges in their lives. And any good brand is always there to solve a problem for uh, for a consumer or to try and address a tension that they might be struggling with that they don't realize. And so this is really the, the place of the conversation. And what is exciting for brands is that whatever the mixture of cultural, um, cultural backgrounds or heritage is, that you can find those um, commonalities in that experience. Of course, if you have heterogeneous groups, there may be little cultural plays or little nuances that you may want to talk to, but a really successful campaign will find that Muslim consumer moment and be able to speak to it in a way that even if you're not directly from that culture, even if you were from a different country looking in and watching an advert on Facebook, you would be able to connect with that. And if you really wanted to set yourself a huge challenge as a brand, there would be something in that That, that even someone who is not Muslim would be able to resonate with, would be able to look at and say, I, I understand that struggle that somebody's going through. And brands really have to ask themselves the question, how closely into that tension and how explicit are they? Or can they frame their conversation in a way that Muslim audiences know it's for them, but feels relevant to a wider audience? So I think the simple answer is you go, you go for that tension. You find out what your generation M is struggling with and you try and speak to that tension in their lives and that will accommodate a vast majority of your your audience and of course we live in you were talking about the e umma and the kind of global reach of it so we live in a world where if you show an advert or a campaign in one country that's to do with being your muslim identity it will be seen by muslims all around the world and they will feel free to comment about it And it, sometimes that has done really good things for a brand. And sometimes it's led them into terrible trouble where they haven't been mindful of the fact that their um, concepts will be taken out of context elsewhere. So it is always worth remembering that your Muslim consumer is part of that global community. pero también cualitativa, también hay más creativa, son más creativos. Aquí también existe un peligro, no podemos ser ingenuos de, de dirigirnos a ellos de una forma simplista, porque correría uno el riesgo que con un enfoque simplista puede funcionar como boomerang que nos dé de vuelta en la cabeza. Pós, nem, caricata, nem caricaturas, por favor, podias eh, explicar como podemos evitar esse tipo de, de problemas, de estereótipos? And when you observe what brands are doing in the marketplace. So the first one is the one that you've outlined, which is uh, you've decided you should have a conversation with this audience, which is fantastic. Um, but you're worried that you're going to say something terribly wrong and your brand will get cancelled or you're going to actually make things worse for yourself and create a backlash with this particular audience. And the way to think about this is that um, you, you have to just do what you do well, right? So um, Muslim consumers in terms of marketing principles don't behave differently to any other consumer segment. They're not aliens that if you put in an advert that says X, they're not going to do something unexpected. And the core marketing principles are understand your audience and find the insight into where your brand or product can help them and avoid cliches. Don't, don't do stereotypes because that is disrespectful to your, your consumer. And in this case, your Muslim consumer. And brands often often forget what they know of Muslim audiences 
when they sit down at their desks in a meeting to plan a campaign. So when you go out onto the street, and, and I live in London, and, and Barcelona is also a very multicultural city that has lots of Muslims in it. When you go out onto the street, you see lots of Muslims and you see how they engage, you see the way they look, the way they stand, their attitudes. And somehow when we come into the office, uh, or the virtual office these days, we seem to forget all of that and it becomes a stereotype based on the headlines that we read in the in the newspapers. And so the first thing is just to, to apply the higher standards of marketing to Muslim audiences that you would elsewhere and engage some experts who can understand your consumer audience, which is the reason that we exist at Ogilvy, for example, to give that expert insight. It is absolutely not acceptable to phone up your Muslim friend who works in IT or accounts and say, is it okay if I say this once you've produced a campaign? Because they are not an expert in Muslim consumers and they also should not have the responsibility to create your marketing campaign for you. So I think that the answer to that worry is do what you're good at and treat your Muslim consumer as you treat other consumers with respect and get some experts who have actual Muslim consumer understanding to help you. The second part of the worry, um, which I think was kind of in your question, but perhaps not explicit, is that in the world we live in, people are often worried that if they have a, uh, an out loud conversation with Muslims, there will be a backlash um, from certain parts of society. Why are you talking to Muslims? You should not talk to Muslims. ...con usted y le va a preguntar, oye, ¿por qué está involucrándose con los musulmanes? Sí, sí, efectivamente. Y yo pienso que la respuesta a esa pregunta es una respuesta... There's a commercial opportunity here, and that's what brands are designed to and set up to do, is to talk to audiences where they can develop growth for their businesses. But there are more complicated, but also more obvious answers to that, which is, it is the right thing to do to talk to all of your consumers in the same way that the conversation over the summer suddenly kind of went, yes, we should have better, uh, we should have more equality in society and fairness, and we can see that this doesn't happen. The same applies to talking to different consumers. In my view, uh, if, we're, if we want to achieve more equal um, and just societies, I know it sounds very trivial, but the ability to go shopping and have your needs served in a way that is respectful and equal to everybody else surely is the marker of a capitalist a liberal society. Um, so, you know, there is a moral argument to be done for it. But there's also finally, um, I think for a lot of brands, we've reached a place where we are now thinking about socially responsible organizations and often backlash um, it seems very loud, seems everywhere but comes from a very small number of consumers and I think brands have started to learn based on that backlash that actually it does their brand and their brand value much more good to stand firm and to actually um, stand up against those voices because the kind of consumers that are coming along both millennial consumers generation z as well as muslim consumers actually appreciate a brand taking a line we don't we don't sit neutrally anymore we expect our brands to take a, a position and one of the examples that comes to mind most clearly um, is that a few years ago in in the usa there was a a, a reality tv program called all american muslim um, for those of you who are fans are kind of an early version of you know Kim Kardashian and her family or Jersey Shore or I, I don't know what the Spanish equivalents are and there was seemingly a backlash against this because the claim was that it made Muslims look normal which seems like a very nice thing to do and not a problematic thing but there was um, the brands that advertised in the break were targeted and felt under pressure by this backlash to withdraw their advertising. Now, when they did, they then had a backlash from their consumers, which said, we don't understand why you have backed down. You know, it's perfectly normal to treat your audiences in this way with a kind of respect. And actually your brand is now diminished in our eyes by doing that. So that, that was the first thing that happened to that brand that withdrew and, and buckled to the backlash. But the second thing, and this is the interesting bit, they actually tracked down 
where this backlash was coming from. And it turned out to be one man in his house in Florida. And so I think the moral of the story is that your brand will gain strength if you stand up for this more open and inclusive engagement. And secondly, the backlash is never as big as you think it is. Uh, firstly, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, good afternoon, maybe now. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, and it's a pleasure to be speaking to you all. Um, I, I guess um, Shalina has led me on really well there because she's actually described me. Um, I, I think, I, I, I do, I do just fall into the millennial bracket and I'm Muslim, um, I'm British. Um, I identify myself as a British Muslim. And, and, and that is a complexity on its own. Thankfully, I don't have to deal with that because I, I, I really look at travel. Um, and you know, for me, my passion has always been travel. And I, I spent about 10 years in the industry before I set up um, my first venture. And I, I, I came out of, I remember coming out of, of, of my, my last day in the office and um, I sort of thought to myself, well, where am I going to book a holiday? Who am I going to go to? Which site am I going to go to? Which travel agent should I have a chat with and I didn't know I, I literally didn't have anybody to turn to and and one of the reasons that a lot of um, brands have have now appeared over the last decade through entrepreneurial spirit of them of, of, of British Muslims is purely to solve a problem that we previously had no solution to and and primarily um, I wanted to continue traveling the world I, I wanted to um, explore places that were outside of my comfort zone um, so rather than traveling to Morocco, Dubai, Turkey, I wanted to go to Vietnam. I wanted to go to, um, you know, uh, Brazil and Argentina. I, I wanted to see places that my peers saw, my, my colleagues saw. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to ensure that I can travel in a way that is comfortable for myself. And, and that's really where the, the idea behind Muslim friendly travel came from. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the uh, one of one of the biggest challenges we've had as an industry, as a, as a Muslim travel industry over the past eight to ten years now, has been finding what this definition actually means. Um, it started off as halal friendly. It started off so it started off as halal travel, um, and then we sort of started going into the world of Sharia compliant. Um, and, and and at that point, I felt that a, you know it was a juncture that a lot of people decided that, hang on a minute, this is really tough for us to deal with. We don't want to, we want to get cancelled. Like Shalina said, we don't want to um, put our brand at risk um, and you know, put our, our current crop of um, customers in, in, a, in a situation where they have to make a decision whether to buy from us or not. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that I, I as a traveler, um, want everything that a normal traveler experiences that fits within my lifestyle and for us and a lot of the research that we that we do here at Rihala and Serendipity it actually revolves a lot around the experience um, and it's experience first and it's the hygiene factors second and I'm not and I'm not putting them as a, as a one and two but I'm putting them as the way that a traveler a Muslim traveler 
aged between sort of, you know, 24 to 40 will look at how they're going to plan their trip. So I'll take an example. During the um, during the, this lockdown period, um, Portugal was one of the places that um, was allowed. To, we were allowed to travel to Portugal and, and vice versa for a short period of time. Um, and we did a bit of bit of analysis on you know what what were people doing um, in terms of searches. And there were a few other Muslim countries they could go to. They could go to Turkey at that point. Um, and you'll be surprised that the number of searches that we had for Lisbon and the Algarve were as much as we had going into Turkey. And the reason being is that we, they literally only had two options. So for them, the experience of going to Portugal for, had, had, very, had many similarities as going to Turkey. The, the idea that they can go and have a great trip in, in, uh, in Portugal is that uh, the priority is at the forefront of their, of their decision making. The second part of that is, okay, where can I stay? Where can I eat? Where can I pray? And ultimately, those are three really simple questions to answer based on the, the infrastructure of, um, of, of where your property, for example, if you're a hotel where you're located. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we do for, for a lot of our clients is that before they travel, we let them know, especially if they're going to a non-Muslim city. If we're going to a city or a country non-Muslim, we inform them where they can eat, where they can pray on Sundays, donde pueden reunirse con otras comunidades. Whilst, you know, they're not going to go on an excursion with other Muslims and they're quite happy to go on an excursion with you know, all types of travelers, they, it'll be nice to, you know, go and see how the local Muslim community um, has fared, how, how, you know, what is their local cuisine like? Um, and, and that's a really engaging part of travel. And whether you're Muslim or not, you know, the, the, the joy of travel is meeting other people. And that doesn't change for Muslim travelers. Of course, um, and, and that's uh, been part of my mission over the last decade, um, is really to open up the opportunities to, to countries that wouldn't necessarily have thought of the Muslim market as a, as a viable commercial um, option. And, I, and, I, and, and that commercial viability is really important because I would not expect any business to do something where they cannot um, benefit from it, both um, commercially and socially. Um, I think both of them play hand in hand. And at the end of the day, if you're going to make changes or you're going to make accommodations, um, then you need to see a return on that. And, and, that's, and that's really important. Um, Muslims in, the, in, in Europe are, are avid travelers, whether they, I mean, I, our experience is in the UK and we know what their characteristics are like, but we've had, you know, uh, customers coming in from Norway, from uh, the, Scand the Scandic region, from France, uh, from, from Spain as well. Um, but I would say that UK travellers are quite adventurous. Um, they, they have this um, characteristic where they like to discover new places and they like to almost do it on their own. They don't necessarily need handhelding. And that makes it quite nice for, for, for service providers. So when it comes to hotels, for example, um, one of our biggest pieces of advice is that they don't necessarily have to change their hotel for a whole year. They don't need to find, um, they don't have to buy in an, a whole new kitchen or create a new building just for cooking for Muslim uh, travelers. 
um, there are very there are there are really subtle changes that you can make to your service. But I think the most important thing is to recognize who who you're welcoming to your um, to your property. And and this really runs for whether they are Muslim, whether they are vegan, whether they are um, you know uh, have a family, whether they whether they need um, special assistance. Um, it, the rules are still the same. But for Muslim travelers, um, priority number one has always been food um, because most travelers would have breakfast in their hotels, um, which doesn't mean that the hotel has to um, specifically change their buffet for the, for the whole day, for, for a week or however long that person's staying there. Um, but being aware of um, what halal um, consumption means is a huge step to understanding how to treat those customers when they're sitting down for breakfast. Exactly. Exactly. Understanding those boundaries is really important. A Muslim traveler will quite happily have breakfast in a hotel. Um, and if there are if there are no halal meat options, as long as their food has been um, prepared in a halal way. So, for example, they're taking a breakfast as an example. But, you know, let's say their eggs have been um, prepared separately. Uh, in, a, in a separate pan, for example. So there's no cross-contamination. ...preparada, o sea, que no, hay, que no surja un, el tema de la contaminación. Pueden tener su café, su buffet, que esté bien etiquete, etiquetado y, 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 y que el servicio tenga, se, sea higiénico. Una vez que han terminado el desayuno, eh, ellos van a, van a sentir que han hecho su trabajo bien. Por ejemplo, si ellos llegan a su habitación de hotel, eliminen el, al, el alcohol de, eliminen las bebidas de alcohol del minibar, los puede almacenar. El sentimiento simplemente, sí. Y, 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 y va a añadir, si lo hace bien y tiene un buen sentimiento hacia ellos, no tiene que invertir en una gran campaña de marketing para que le... Pa, no, tiene que invertir, no tiene que invertir en en segmentos de publicidad específicos, porque la reacción de esos viajantes, si se les trata bien, pues va a ser positiva. Y, estamos, y no se olvide que somos una audiencia muy digital y nunca hay que infraestimar lo que es la campaña de palabra a palabra. Ese viajante va a volver y va, y va a hablar con otro, con otra, con otro viajante, con otros... Y pronto, pues ese turista va a ficar satisfeito y va a dar... Eh publicidad a través de las redes sociales o para sus amigos, va a recomendar estos establecimientos. Eh, esto, eh, esto no es solamente un mercado, sino también eh, es multipersonal, ¿no es? Eh? Sí, sí, sí. Um, and whether you're Muslim or not, you, you, you swear by TripAdvisor, even though the reviews are sometimes um, biased or skewed. In the main, it's a good tool. It's a great tool to find out what people think of a, of a hotel. And, if you, so, and if, you, if you look for keywords, if you look for your own keywords within, the trip, within TripAdvisor for a hotel or your hotel, it's a really good gauge to see how people are, are, are reacting to services that you would like to provide. So I remember going to a few hotels, I think it was in Mexico, I think, um, and just typing in hello into a couple of hotels and, and suddenly, you know, there's people that say, oh my God, they, they provided me with, you know, um, a hello food for the week, or, you know, they, they managed to um, provide me with, um, you know, a bit more privacy in my room, for example, you know, and, and, and those sort of things are absolutely golden. I mean, they, they, they're, they're, so, they're so easy to, um, implement but the value that comes out of it um you know can can be huge yeah Absolutely. And, and one thing I think with the audience... Una... 
y ahora esto quiero eh, se relaciona directamente con la audiencia tiene una gran oportunidad no está compitiendo ahora mismo para el viajante musulmán con otros hoteles o con países vecinos usted no está sentado en el sureste de, de, de Asia o en Oriente Medio en el que hay tantas o, tan, tantas diferentes alternativas. y tanta... Aquí ustedes tienen una gran oportunidad de diferenciarse de la mayoría de los competidores y, y elegir los canales mm, correctos para mm, comercializar su servicio o producto, lo que sea. Es ahora mismo una gran oportunidad para diferenciarse, especialmente en mercados limitados como eh, los europeos, con respecto al viajante musulmán. Muchísimas gracias. Una pregunta que me gustaría formular a ambos, Selina y Anabel igualmente. ¿Qué tipo de impacto piensan ustedes? Y todo el mundo lo pregunta en todos los segmentos. Usted ya conoce las preguntas y ya conocen la respuesta. ¿Cuál es el impacto que podemos esperar en términos generales, en términos de patrones de consumo con, y hoy en día con, con la situación COVID? Bien, en el caso de Nabil, ¿qué podemos esperar? ¿Qué expectativas podemos tener el impacto de esos dos segmentos, del segmento musulmán y del segmento, del, del segmento de turismo? Le voy a dar la visión general y posteriormente voy a entrar en, en los en las particularidades. Uno de los informes que le gustaría ver a la audiencia, que es el estado de la economía global y la economía islámica, describe es, es, cómo se puede involucrar uno con el cliente con, o consumidor, cons, consumidor musulmán y se acaba de publicar el informe para el, del 2021. El del 2019 fue un año bastante bastante fraccionado, había gran número de crecimiento y de fragmentación. No sorprende que en 2020 que ha habido una gran ha habido una contracción, una reducción y hay una reducción del 8% en, en el mercado. Pero si, pero seguimos analizando dos billones de dólares que se gastan todos los años, billones con B. Y como dije anteriormente, para las empresas que van a buscar pues, sobreponerse a la contracción de la economía general, estas audiencias que no están en su radar van a ser muy importantes para asegurar el crecimiento. Y es muy importante recordar que, lo, que dos tercios de los musulmanes tienen menos de 30 años, o sea que son consumidores jóvenes, su visitante va a ser un re resiliente en términos de consumo, sí, porque ellos van a rebotar antes. El turismo musulmán se tiene la expectativa que no se va a rebotar tan rápidamente porque la economía islámica... O sea, sí van a rebotar, pero deberían volver a, a su estado normal en el 2020, a finales de 2021. Nabil, tiene la palabra. Sí. Claro, los viajes han sido han recibido un gran impacto. Yo recuerdo en marzo. Y se dice que hasta el 2023 no volveremos al estado de, via de y al número de viajes del 2019 no volveremos hasta el 2023. Pero la realidad es que sí, vamos a necesitar tiempo para que volvamos a la normalidad. Pienso que con el viajante musulmán y especialmente, eh, especialmente el segmento de los mil, musulmanes millennials, ellos siempre han tenido una propensidad a viajar, ellos siempre quieren viajar. No es algo que van a sacrificar o que les gusta sacrificar. Eso es una de las listas, de, de, una, una de las cosas en la lista que quieren hacer. Porque eh, quizás necesitan escaparse de su trabajo diario o quizás simplemente tienen esa afiliación natural para... Conocer, irse con la familia o ir solo, tomarse tiempo y reagruparse y disfrutar el tiempo con la familia. Nosotros somos una, un, muy comunitario, vivimos mucho en comunidad. Así que pienso que soy bastante positivo realmente sobre cómo 
los viajantes musulmanes van a reaccionar en el 2021. Estamos viendo ya señales que, de planes que se están haciendo. Hemos, hay clientes que nos han llamado. ¿Cuándo puedo ir aquí? ¿Cuándo puedo ir a este sitio? ¿Puedo alquilar? Y hacen preguntas. Si no hicieran ninguna pregunta o formularan preguntas, estaría muy preocupado. Pero ahora mismo están muy involucrados están buscando qué hacer en el futuro, yo no diría que necesariamente tienen miedo al COVID. Están concienzados, son responsables en su mayoría, conocen los riesgos de viajar en tiempos de COVID, pero al final del día tienen una visión bastante pragmática sobre el asunto, evaluando los riesgos y sabiendo que viajar para ellos es algo que están esperando, que desean. Selina. Una pregunta por mi lado en ese sentido. Estamos pensando sobre la globalidad de los consumidores musulmanes. Por supuesto, nos tenemos que... ¿Cuáles son los países actualmente? ¿Cuáles son los países o mercado? Más relevante. Con su visión, ¿dónde piensa? ¿Cuáles serán los buenos mercados, digamos, en un plazo de cinco años? ¿Con mayoría musulmana o con minoría musulmana? A un, en escala global, ¿dónde piensa usted? ¿Cuáles son los, los mercados buenos o positivos? Y en el caso de Europa, como España, ¿dónde piensan? ¿Cuáles van a ser los mercados más resilientes? En términos de la economía islámica general, la gran oportunidad está en está Oriente Medio, eso no es sorprendente, Oriente Medio, países no, del norte de África, donde hay una, un alto gasto de, de, capital, de gasto per cápita, pero ahora analizando los mercados y viendo cómo han avanzado, los mercados que han, los mercados que hay, por ejemplo, Indonesia es grande, Malasia, Singapur, eh, eh, tiene un país con minoría musulmana que está dentro de ese espacio musulmán, es eh, también muy importante. Y posteriormente tenemos grandes mercados, Pakistán, Bangladesh, Nigeria, algunos de los otros países no, eh, del África del Norte y también el sur de África y África Oriental. Y existe una gran oportunidad en India en la que vamos dentro de pronto vamos a tener la mayor población musulmana del mundo, porque la demografía nos muestra que, so, que hay un gran número de jóvenes y, y, y ahí, se están, ahí va a haber grandes potenciales e interesantes para el desarrollo de marca. Y ahora pasando a Occidente, Estados Unidos tiene una conversación muy interesante sobre halal y el consumidor. Es un huge, huge market and very influential outside its own boundaries because it is really the home to a lot of the, the startups that have become you know, very established businesses like uh, Modernisa, which is the, the fashion one. And, um, and you know, as, as Nabil was saying, they have started to develop quite a, a well-regarded um, Muslim-friendly travel sector, which is very appealing for Muslims who live in minority countries to just hop over. Um, but I think if we're looking in Europe specifically, I mean, we have some big Muslim populations in Europe. So in the UK, we have an excess of 4 million. In France, I think it's coming up for, for almost 6 million. In Germany, it's around 5 million. Um, so when you, when you add up the Muslim minority populations in Europe, they actually exceed the populations of some of those Middle East um, countries. So if you're thinking about how to prioritize your audiences on sheer numbers, Your Muslim minorities in Europe are larger in size than entire countries that you have in other places around the world. And so, you know, kind of go, oh, okay, well, maybe we should be paying a bit more attention closer to home. And um,
Well, well, this is exactly the kind of question that we work with clients to answer. So clients come to us and say, and we kind of worked with them to say, well, there, there is this opportunity here. Is this something that we can maybe concept test in one country? Um, and then just kind of um, uh, poll test it in some of the others and just see if it generally works or might need some refinement. So obviously some of the faces that you would have on that campaign, maybe some of the messages would be a little bit more elevated than the others. But typically the excitement about this audience is that you can have that same brand message and the same campaign that works across all of those countries. So I, I think it's typical in a campaign that you might start to have some regional variations in in that concept but typically you can create one single concept that would work across all of those um, different countries so it, it's exciting and the numbers themselves and the fact it's you know greenfield opportunity should in this difficult time be making us think about what the opportunity is close to home in europe Great, Javier, thank you very much. I wanted to congratulate all three of you. First of all, because you have really, you have really stayed within your time slot. For, personally, it has been, I, I, I really, it was a debate, it was easy to follow. It has, you've provided us with lots of useful information, which is really the important thing in this case. But before I go into the questions, which are, being read by my colleagues, I'm going to take the advantage that I have and I'm going to formulate a question for each of you and I'm going to formulate three questions together. Javier can respond then later Selina and Nabil will be responding last. But before I formulate the questions, I would like to underline uh, of what I have heard this morning. In first place, there's a word which has been repeated quite seriously, which has been entrepreneurship. And I've been very happy to hear that word entrepreneurship, because that's what this, uh, what the Three Cultures Foundation is devoted to. That's what we have been working for more than 20 years in entrepreneurship. The director of the foundation states that in order to know you, in, in order to, to know, you have to know, and with the knowledge that you have contributed today, we are able to know this market better and to know these people better, this type of Muslims, this type of Muslim segment. So I've been very happy about the word entrepreneurship and understanding. And I myself... Que, y me repito, es a lo que la Fundación Tres Culturas se dedica. Y por otro lado, me gustaría también destacar eh, otra palabra que ha sonado mucho y que es difícil oír en estos días en el que todo cuando se habla de negocio, cuando se habla de economía, que es la oportunidad. ¿Eh? También ha salido recu recurrentemente la palabra oportunidad y creo que hemos visto que aquí existe una gran oportunidad para eh, consolidar mercados, para abrir empresas dentro de muy poco tiempo. ¿no? Ya Nabil creo que ha sido el que ha dicho que ya pues, van recibiendo llamadas, eh, gente interesada, en, bueno, dónde vamos a poder ir y cómo vamos a poder ir. De hecho, la pregunta que tengo para Nabil va un poco por ahí. Entonces, insisto, antes de dar paso a las preguntas del público, yo quería aprovechar y hacer eh, tres preguntas. La primera es para Javier y es un poco eh, a nivel personal. Eh, yo he detectado cuando, porque también otra idea que ha salido mucho es que este tipo de productos y servicios, que siempre se nos olvida que también hay servicios, no solo están destinados a musulmanes, sino que hay otro tipo de, de consumidor que también le, puede, le, le pueden interesar estos productos. ¿no? Yo he notado, por ejemplo, en sitios, tanto hoteles como restaurantes que he ido, eh, que, que, que tenían esto, ¿no? estos servicios halal, que eh, hay cierta sofisticación en el producto y en el servicio. ¿no? Entonces, me gustaría, Javier, que por favor incidieras un poco más en esa idea de sofisticación que parece que este tipo de, de clientes eh, eh, requiere. ¿no? Por otro lado, la pregunta, Shelina, es, es obligada. Eh, 
¿cómo podemos conseguir tu libro? Aquellos que no estamos en el Reino Unido, ¿eh? por favor, indícanos, porque es verdad que he leído reseñas eh, y ya he comentado antes que, que es un superventas, pero bueno, a mí me gustaría adquirirlo. Reviews, I would like to buy it personally, so please inform us where and how can we get a copy of your book, especially for those of us that are not in the United Kingdom. And lastly, for Nabil, Nabil, I would like also, I don't know if you have mentioned it, that you please provide us also a reference of your company, web page, telephone number, somewhere where we can look at your offers and your services and products offered. Because of course, some, some Spaniard might be interested to use your services. And I would really like that you give us information Well, especially your web page, Javier, please respond and then we go in the order that I said it. Muchas gracias, Germinal. Pienso que la pregunta de sofisticación. clientes que, eh, que dan mucho valor eh, por tanto están, son más, están, están a ser más exigentes son el consumidor más exigente que no habla solamente de la carne eh, ellos quieren más Ah, exige más dos productos. La gama de servicios y productos. No hay nada que, que no hay nada que se, que se, no hay nada que sea amigable hacia el turista musulmán que no se, que no pueda ser consumido por alguien que no es musulmán. O sea, cualquiera lo puede consumir. Aquí estamos hablando de mayor sofisticación, diversificación. Y, y, esto, y estos servicios y esta sofisticación también la pueden disfrutar los no musulmanes. O sea, aquí estamos hablando de servicios productos más sostenibles. Por ejemplo, ofrecer el producto o servicio halal pueden ser consumidos por, por otras familias y otras personas no, no musulmanes. Eso es seguro. Selina, tú lo sabes, yo tengo tu libro... Y me lo tengo hasta firmado y todo. Y ya hace bastante tiempo. Bien. ¿Esto es el libro? ¿Lo, sí, lo pueden ver, sí. Así que debería estar disponible. The internet, the magic of the internet. You should be able to get a copy if you want a, a real copy like that one. Um, otherwise, there are digital versions available as well. So hopefully... Um, being far away and in different places shouldn't matter. Um, otherwise, I'm sure we could arrange some kind of special delivery. So don't don't worry, all things are possible. Um, I think it's only in English, sadly, at the moment, but maybe Kavi and I can do some magic and see if there's a way to get a Spanish version. Uh, an audio book would be great, Julian. I think you're, you're perfectly set up to get that onto Audible. You, everyone fancies me doing some bedtime reading about the opportunity of the Islamic economy. Exactly, exactly. It's good. It's good running. It's good running. Uh, good running um, uh, scripts. Um, I, I, I've actually just um, added a couple of links to the chat here. Um, thank you for for offering to for us to um, just share a few links. Um, but th there are actually two links that will put, that are probably more relevant for the audience. Um, the first one is a, a white paper that we wrote, um, really focusing around the Muslim millennial traveler. Um, it's completely free. Um, just uh, go to the link, download it, and there's information there that you can get a bit more uh, information, sorry, get a bit more of an idea of how um, the Muslim millennial uh, traveler thinks um, and looks for. Um, and then the second one, which is um, the forward slash uh, spotlight, Um, that one is for any hotels that are looking to um, be part um, of Rahala and the Rahala site. 
Um, we're definitely putting a, a priority on hotels that are able to provide services to Muslim countries to Muslim travelers that are in non-Muslim countries um, because we feel that they they really need to have as much support as they can. Um, all of this is, you know, for us, we, we don't charge anything for it. You know, at the end of the day, the, the mutual benefit is getting people to book and sending them off to um, to use your services. So um, feel free to use either of those. Um, if you have any questions about um, what you can provide your um, your Muslim travelers when they arrive, if you need any more clarification on that, you know, we're always open to, um, to, to provide advice over email, via Zoom or whatever. For us, it would be a great pleasure to be able to share all this information with all the interested parties. And we will do so. Well, there are many questions that we have. Unfortunately, there's not enough time for all the questions. However, it's nevertheless true that some of the questions have been already dealt with during the session, but I understand that when they ask for uh, it's because it might be a, a, a more a, a deeper response. We don't have um, too much time. We're going to get a couple of questions for each speaker, some for Shalina, some for Nabil. And with this, we will close the forum for today. Shalina, the first question for you that we have is the following. It says, when we address Muslim consumers, how important is it what, how important is their cultural background or their national origin when we, when, when, let's say, the question is if they are Pakistanis, Turkey, uh, Turkish or whatever, that origin, how important? Necesita decidir si habla con ese consumidor como musulmán o como un, un, un cliente de ese país. O un, a veces se solapa, pero eso es la primera pregunta que se tiene que formular. Y a veces me, eso hay, o puede a lo mejor buscar algo en su vida. Que... Is it Ramadan? Am I traveling because I want something halal? Am I looking for finance which uh, meets my Islamic principles? Um, and then decide accordingly. Estupendo. Eh, pasamos ahora a Nabil. Nos preguntan eh, aquí en la, en la audiencia cuáles son los principales destinos que los musulmanes milenias prefieren hacer en, en Europa. Bueno, nos preguntan en Europa y en el mundo, ¿no? Pero en principio, si, si tienes algunos datos que aportarnos, ¿no? ¿Cuáles son esos destinos? Sí, seguro. Lo is actually for Europe traveling within Europe. And the other one is for um, uh, travelers coming in from, say, Southeast Asia. Que vienen del sureste de Asia, Estados Unidos, o como, o como viajante musulmán que vienen a Europa. Y estas son, son dos expectativas muy diferentes y experiencias muy diferentes. Los europeos dentro de Europa salen en los fines de semana, Será su tercer o cuarto viaje que, que tomen los musulmanes europeos, dentro de Europa estamos hablando. Si analizamos las reservas que tenemos y las búsquedas fuera de Europa, tienden a ser a las ciudades principales. Barcelona probablemente es número uno en la lista, está número uno en la lista. Una de mis ciudades favoritas es Barcelona. Pienso que Barcelona... Hace un trabajo fantástico en su marketing, pero en general, no necesariamente solo hacia los musulmanes. Y eso, ¿cuál es la palabra? Hay una, para un musulmán es fácil decir, oye, yo también quiero ir a Barcelona o a un país a ver esos lugares, a ver ese lugar. Las ciudades principales, Ámsterdam también es un gran, una gran opción en este momento para para nuestros clientes en el Reino Unido y posteriormente algunas de las ciudades históricas, Roma, obviamente, siempre popular, y se, Israel también se está haciendo muy popular. ¿Por qué no? Perdón. Muy bien. Eh... Ahora hay un... 
Sí, por favor, continúa. Eh, un momento. Si me permite un momento, que, que puedo añadir 15 segundos. Barcelona fue anteriormente, antes de COVID, fue, se convertía en una ciudad, un destino muy que estaba que tenía una gran tendencia y es una buena tendencia y para los musulmanes cre, crecía en términos de atractividad. Eso no quiere decir que Barcelona está tan lista como debería estar o tan preparada para atraer y, que, y, y cumplir con todo el potencial. Era atractivo más allá de su adaptación real. Imagínense si son capaces de adaptarse realmente y esto sería realmente un cambio en atractivo. Lo siento, lo siento, ¿vale? Solo quería decir, añadir esto. Simplemente para terminar sobre los musulmanes fuera de Europa. A ellos les encanta ir a todos los sitios que sea posible, al, al mayor número de sitios. Ten, tenemos una gran red de, de agencias en Malasia y ellos intentan eh, beber 10 ciudades en 10 días. Y simplemente porque han oído tanto sobre estas ciudades, quieren, quieren pues, chequearlas mmm, chequearla y, y viajar a un montón de ciudades. Por ejemplo, si quiere viajar al sureste de Asia, si quiere atraer a los del suroeste de Asia que, y tener estos servicios para que ellos puedan elegir Barcelona, Lisboa o otra ciudad meramente porque los servicios están ahí en su lugar, pues esto, esto sería estupendo para la planificación. Muy bien, vamos a recoger eh, las dos últimas preguntas. Um, y esta es para, para Shelina. La verdad que la, la pregunta me parece muy interesante, pero creo que casi estaría para, para, eh, para un nuevo foro. ¿eh? De todas formas, te voy a pedir, eh, Shelina, eh, concreción, porque la pregunta es la siguiente. ¿Existen diferencias significativas eh, con respecto al comportamiento de este tipo de consumidores de la primera generación de musulmanes que eran migrantes y la segunda y la tercera que ya son nativos? generations in, in contrast to those Muslims already born in those countries, first and second generation. I'm going to rephrase it so to make sure that you understand it. Difference between Muslims, Im immigrants and their children and grandchildren in consumer patterns, in other words. Okay, so you want me, I have to answer in two sentences a question which is enough for a PhD thesis. Um, the short answer is yes, there is a difference and One of those differences is that they is what is Generation M. They want to bring their modern views of life together with their faith and be very explicit about them. Whereas they may talk about their first generation immigrant parents as establishing some traditions, just doing the basics to get established in the new country, but without necessarily Uh, thinking about their identity as formed from both of these things. And one of the data points that the audience can check is that the pride in being, for example, both British and Muslim is very high. So 74% of British Muslims say that their faith um, is very important to them along with their identity. And they feel more positively about their Britishness than The peop than peop British people generally. And that is true across all of the Muslim minority populations in Europe. So there is a big shift, which the whole of Generation M is the proof of that shift of the difference between the arrival immigrants and the subsequent generations. Great, and the last question. For Nabil, I do believe it's a little bit related with what you commented earlier on. And the question focused on COVID-19. It's a bit, well, can you give us a forecast of how do you believe the sector, the tourism sector, the sector might evolve? You have told us there's already an interest, but what is your, what is your perspective on the short medium Me, in the short, medium term of time, and how is the sector going to evolve? What is your opinion? 
Um, I am very, I, I tend to be more positive than negative. I'm a, I'm a person that looks at things uh, half full rather than half empty. Um, I, if you had asked me this a month ago, I would have probably said that 2021 was going to be um, probably the most difficult year for travel um, since travel, um, the industry began even harder than 2020. Um, but I think the news of a potential vaccine, which I, th I still think needs to be taken with some um, caution um, because we haven't got it out yet. Um, this hasn't gone away yet. Um, I think just changes my perspective on that a little bit. And I do feel like towards the end of 2021, we might start to see travel returning to some normality. Um, personally, I think January, February, March, Q1 of next year is going to remain um, in limbo. It's going to be, you know, it, we're, we're not sure exactly how it could turn out. But, you know, we're, we're hoping that the, the signs are right within the aviation industry, um, within the uh, regulatory bodies um, are all stating that, you know, by, by sort of April and Q2, um, we might be able to find um, common agreements between destinations um, to allow travelers to, to, to have almost like a, an enhanced travel corridor. Um, so in short, I would say, you know, next three months, I don't think there's going to be much change. Um, three to six months, I think we'll start to see um, improvements. We're probably looking at maybe still 30, 40% occupancies for hotels and, and, and air capacities. Um, but let's hope we have a really good um, winter season next year um, or even a late summer season next year um, and, and try to um, sort of uh, you know, bring, bring this whole industry back to, to where it needs to be. Estupendo. Muy bien. Bueno, Great. Pues creo que... I believe that we have depleted our time that we had today devoted to the second um, online participation. The only thing what I can say is to thank Shalina, Nabil, and Javier, and of course, all the audience. También a nuestra audiencia, a nuestro público, y lembrar que este proyecto va a continuar a realizar actividades a través da web de este proyecto. Culturas, que es tresculturas.org. Les animamos también a que, por favor, sigan nuestras redes sociales, porque por ahí... social networks, I mean, uh, that's where we... Uh, in, they, they, where you can see our events live. And now to finish up regarding the project, I would like to remind or inform those of you that do not know that we are developing a platform, a software platform and an app so we are able, this is devoted to SMEs, small and medium sized companies to be able to offer all those services, obviously without any cost to you, any cost for the companies and especially for the Portuguese and as well as for the, for the Andalusian SMEs, we will inform you once this app and platform is available so that you become part of it, you will be able to exhibit your products, your services, you might, you might, you might advertise them, and it will, and we believe it will be, it will be finished around next year. Certainly the administrative process is quite advanced. And now in order to finish, I will also finish the way how I started. I will el programa Transfronteirizo del, del FEDER, del Fondo de Desarrollo Europeo, pues no sería posible que lo tuviéramos. Eh, lo dejamos aquí. Muchísimas gracias a todos y hasta la próxima. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Muchas gracias. Ha sido un placer.